My guest today is Nicholas Stern. Nick is a professor of economics at the LSE. Formerly, he was vice president of the World Bank and second permanent secretary to the English Treasury. His research focuses on international climate policies. He headed the Stern Review, an extremely influential analysis of the economics of climate change and what we needed to do to avoid global warming. So the way you, you put it, both both objectives of growth and environment are, are aligned. And let me let me push back a little bit on that. So so Olivier Blanchard and others have said, well, you know, in some sense, uh, Mike Greenstone said, said, talked here about no, no free lunch in some sense, which is, okay, the kind of investments that you might need in order to get strong growth back might not be the greenest investments. And the greenest investments might be not necessarily the ones that you can get going in one, two years. Uh, to get your economy recovered, so those are not necessarily the same objective. How would you how would you answer that? Well, I've been talking to Olivier <laughs> about this actually. Answer in the short run and the medium run. In the short run, uh, we've got real pains in unemployment, and we have to act uh, quickly. And what kinds of investments are fast in implementation, labour intensive, and have strong multipliers? Well, here's some examples. Uh, retrofitting buildings, pushing out uh, broadband, making the infrastructure for uh, charging uh, electric vehicles, making our cities more friendly to pedestrians and cyclists. That's physical capital. Look at natural capital, restoring degraded land, for example, in the UK, restoring our peatlands is, uh, is very, uh, is very uh, important. Uh, so, so much reforesting. So much of what we have to do uh, for a much better uh, form of investment in relation to climate can actually satisfy what Keynes would have looked for in terms of the multipliers, fast, mm -hmm. labour intensive and so on. Um, with these strong co benefits, in the medium term, uh, pushing ahead with the new forms of investment is actually pushing ahead where innovation is particularly uh, strong. The fastest innovation in the world is in these areas. And we're also seeing the benefits of increasing returns to scale. A lot of what happened in solar and wind was about scale. So I think that both in the short run, in the Keynesian multiplier story, and in the more medium term, when you're talking about um, the new forms of investment, driving down costs, greater efficiency, I think that uh, the balance of the argument points to the combination of investment and innovation driving growth by exploring the new frontiers. So um, I was, it was pretty, it was pretty persuasive and, uh, and, and, and hopeful. But what, uh, Nick, what about the tools that we have, the other set of tools apart from investment to fight climate change? You've, you've talked about carbon pricing as necessarily being part of the solution. Yes. Uh, of course, the problem with carbon pricing, and I was hinting at that before, and you talked a little bit about the, the left behind places. The problem with carbon pricing is that uh, there are big distributional impacts, people who drive a lot, people who drive trucks, people who drive uh, tractors, many people who actually are going to pay an extra price and, and never came as clear to the minds of economists what the political constraints are as when, as when Macron tried to do this in France. Yeah. Um, what are the lessons about how to implement carbon prices uh, in a way that, that actually is politically feasible, not just economically sensible? I mean, one thing we must be clear on in economics is that first, this is radical change. And second, when you think about radical change, the challenge of distribution and management should be at center stage. It's not just set a carbon price and everything turns out efficient. It's much deeper, much deeper, more complicated uh, than uh, that. I've already spoken about managing dislocation, investing in people, retraining. But there's also, of course, relative price changes which affect consumers. And it's very important there uh, to use the revenue well with priority for the poorer of the, amongst those groups. Now, on balance, uh, the rich consume more energy than the poor um, by quite a lot. Now, it may go down as a fraction of income, but they still consume more energy than uh, poor people. So there'll be revenue there, uh, which can be redistributed towards the poorer people. It should be possible to make virtually uh, everybody at the bottom end uh, better off uh, using the revenue from uh, 
carbon prices. That should be a strong uh, priority. We also have to remember that poorer people um, don't buy new cars. Uh, at least they buy less new cars than the richer people. So a switch over to electric vehicles will take time to come into the second hand, the used car market. There are quite a lot of parts of this story where the distributional implications are quite complicated, but they should be front and center of policy. And you shouldn't announce a policy and then fix the distribution side later. You should think of the distribution side as you make that policy and do them, uh, do them simultaneously. All right. So hopefully we will see a system in Europe uh, pretty pretty soon. Um, there is uh, other uh, set of of, of, uh, of policies that have been considered for for reaching those those climate goals. Uh, this could inv include uh, public transportation, uh, renewable based power generation. You've talked about some of these policies. Yeah. Um, which are the main if you had to choose three that you would say, look, this is low hanging fruit, you need to do that. To all these governments that now have recovery money in Europe, where should they really, really prioritize? The policies or the investment? Yes. Both, no, both. The investments uh, from the European money, sorry. Where, where should they invest the European money? Which, which would be the key, the key areas that you would think are, are the ones with the highest returns? Uh, if, if you look at the really big emitters, uh, energy, transport, agriculture, and I would focus on those three. Uh, transport, of course, uh, public transport, energy, strong move to renewables, where we look very carefully at grid management and storage. We need European cooperation in grid. The center of Spain, where land is very cheap, the sun is very strong, uh, it should be uh, very strong on solar. Yeah. And we know we can transport that with you know, high voltage uh, direct DC cables over quite long distances quite cheaply. But that needs European cooperation in transmission and distribution, European cooperation around smoothing out renewables. The bigger area you smooth it out over, the easier it is to smooth it out. So transport with public transport and electric uh, vehicles, increasingly autonomous vehicles, the design of cities, that's, a, that's one bag, yeah? The energy system is uh, another bag. Energy efficiency, extremely important uh, in buildings and uh, agriculture. Agriculture around the world has subsidies of around 600, 700 billion dollars, depending how you do the sums, very large. And what do you get? You get degraded land, you get poisoned uh, waterways and rivers, and uh, you get cut down forests. Now, those impact in different ways in different countries around the world. But Europe has its share of that. And it's not that I would reduce the agricultural subsidies, I would make them different. I, public money for public goods. And we could have a much better, actually more productive agriculture and much less degrading of the environment. And incidentally, you could orient it towards, uh, away from the very rich farming enterprise towards the smaller farmers. So there's so much that could be done. But if you're looking at big reductions, look at the big areas. And those are the ones I've tried to uh, describe.